There was a young man who was asked how he had managed to accumulate millions of dollars and at such a young age. And he said that he was, when he was first married, that he had a nickel. And he went out and he purchased an apple and he washed it and he shined it up and he sold it for a dime. And then he took the dime and he purchased two apples and he washed them and shined them up and sold those two apples for 20 cents. And then he took the 20 cents and he bought four apples and he washed them and shined them up and sold them for 40 cents. And at the end of the month, he had made $6.80 profit. He continued to do that for the next two years. And then his father-in-law died and gave him $2 million. Uh, we're going to be talking about money. We're going to be talking about giving. We're going to be talking about generosity. And I don't have any problem talking about it because the scriptures are so full of positive stuff about giving It is something that every one of us needs to know what the Bible says about giving. In your bulletin, I gave you something God wants you to know about giving. Read it, study it, look those verses up, enjoy that. It's not negative, it's positive, it's great stuff. But I want to let you know, first of all, that you decide how much you want God to bless you. Isn't that neat? You decide. Now people are saying, oh, I don't believe that. Well, listen to what it says. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 7 says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now what God does is, through Paul, he uses a farming rule. The rule is plant a little, harvest a little. Plant a lot, harvest a lot. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Uh, You plant a few seeds, you get a small crop. You plant a lot of seeds, you get a generous crop. When it comes to giving to the Lord, God says generous giving yields generous blessings. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus is talking. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I look at that verse and I go, wow. Uh, If I give to God, he's going to return to me more than I have given. So if we give, he says he's going to return it, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now here's the important important part of that phrase. It is with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Meaning, if I give God a little, he will return to me a little. If I give to God generously, the Lord will return to me generously. You go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Now I got to remind you of this. No matter how much you sow, God in his grace will bless you more than you sow. If I take one kernel of corn and put it in the ground, I will get one stalk of corn. On that stalk of corn, there will usually be two ears of corn, a bigger ear and a smaller ear. If you open those ears of corn up, you have hundreds of kernels of corn on each ear of corn. So God gives you for one kernel of corn, hundreds of kernels of corn. If you plant one bean in the ground, you will get a bean stalk, and on that bean stalk, you will get lots of beans. If you plant a cucumber plant in your yard, you will be here at the church trying to give away those cucumbers. (laughs) They just keep coming in abundance. The point is, when you give to God, God in His grace gives more back. Not because you deserved it, not because you earned it, but because of His grace. And His grace says, if you give, I will give back to you more than you gave. 
So we determine how much blessing we want God to pour out on us. Malachi chapter 3. Did I type that out for you? Okay. It says this, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? God's response is this, In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines of your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Now, in this passage of Scripture, there are a lot of lessons that are taught there. And one of the lessons is this. What you have belongs to God. You say, well, I didn't see that. Well, it says there's two kinds of giving. There's tithing, which is 10% of your income. And then there's offerings, which represent your generous giving above that 10%. And the Jewish people were not giving God their tithes, and they weren't giving God their offerings. And God says they were robbing him. Now, how do you rob someone if it doesn't belong to them? So what they had belonged to God. And God said he expected them to take what he had entrusted into their hands, and he expected them, in turn, to give him 10% right off the top, and then to set aside offerings that would go to the needs of others. And if they didn't give a tithe and they didn't do their offerings, they were robbing God. Simple? Now, God is very gracious, though. God says to them, Put me to the test. He's really saying, I know you don't think that if you give to me 10% of everything that you have and give me an offering out of what's left over from that, that what's left over for you will be enough. He says, test me. It is the only place in Scripture where we're told by God that we have the right to test him, to put him to the test, to say to him, God... This is what your word says, and this is what you tell me to do. I'm going to put you to the test on this. We have the right to do that because God says, test me. He says, if you test me by giving your tithes and offerings, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. One translation says, it will just simply be overflowing. Now, God understands that he's entrusted to us so much money. And then he says, I want you to give your tithe and your offering out of what I have given you. If you do, I will take care of your family's needs. And what you have left over will be enough. And I like to throw this in. If you have never been tithing and not been giving offerings, you're just giving some token gifts to God. God sits back and says, if you have dug a hole for yourself by wasting the money that I have given you, if you will start giving to me consistently of your tithes and your offerings, I will help you crawl out of that hole. And you'll discover how gracious I am by the way that I bless you. When I was growing up, I used to hear my parents say things like this, if you give to God your tithes and your offerings, God will rebuke the things that come into your life that devour your income, like fewer doctor visits. Okay, You'll have less doctor visits because those other doctor visits, they devour your income, or uh, fewer automobile repairs because that will devour your income, or things that should last five years will last ten years. God is not limited The point is, if we give to God what belongs to him, he will make what is left over enough, and even more than enough. And I also want to put a little qualifier there. 
Do not expect that if you give him on Monday or Sunday, that on Monday <laughs> you're going to see the blessings. They are coming. God will be faithful. And I recommend this. If you say, I'm going to give to God, even if you're doing it now, giving faithfully, you ought to have a piece of paper handy. And when God sends a blessing in your direction, you ought to write it down. You ought to write, man, God just did that. God just did that. God just did that. And then start looking at all the blessings that God gives you in your life in response to your obedience to his word and trusting him. Write the things down. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there's a couple guidelines that God gives us. He says, you need to make a plan. Okay, you need to make a plan. How much are you going to give to God? That means you don't just come to church on Sunday and the offering plate's being passed, and you fumble through your pocket, and you pull out a wad of bills, and you say, well, I'll give God that. That's not a plan. A plan is that you and your wife sit down, and you say, okay, how much are we bringing in every month, and how much of that are we going to give to God? And you may sit back and say, well, I'll give to God $300 every paycheck. That'll represent the tithe that we give, and you write that down. And, and then we're going to set aside $50 every paycheck for an offering. And you say, well, what would the offering be used for? Well, you may not put it in the offering plate. But you may. You may label it benevolence or whatever. You may just look around for somebody that has a need, and you give them that money to meet that need. Uh, you may start sending $50 to a missionary someplace else. That's an offering gift. I don't know how God's going to lead you. You may sit back and say, well, I don't know how to, well, I'm going to know what my offering should be going to. Well, Certainly your tithe goes to the church and your offering goes other places. Let me just give you a little illustration here. Hundreds of years ago, when people lived near the oceans, the word opportunity was coined. It came from the time when ships needed to wait until the tide was in before heading out to sea. Otherwise, the ships would run aground. The Latin language, the word was ob portu which described the perfect moment when time and tide converged for a ship to leave the harbor. Into every person's life comes some God-ordained opportunities to minister to the needs of others. And when your heart is open to God and you have been systematically putting money aside for a benevolent gift, for an offering to God, waiting for God to speak to your heart. When that opportunity arises, it will manifest itself to you. I'll give you an illustration. George and Jane Mahaffey, who used to come to the church, both of them have died, gone home to be with the Lord. They're receiving their rewards in heaven right now. They always set aside $50 every Sunday for special offering, whatever that would be. One Sunday, I mentioned that Bibles for India had a matching grant. And for every Bible that was sent to India, this person would match it and send a Bible with that Bible. Bibles cost $4 a Bible at that time. So I came back to the church and I said to the church, I would like us to send 1,000 Bibles to India which means we need to raise $4,000, and I want to do this next week. So go home and pray about what you want to give, come back with your gifts and checks, put it in the offering, and then we will send those, that gift to Bible's friend. It was through Bible League. When I said that, that hit George's heart. That's what we've been setting the $50 aside every week for. He came up to me at the end of the service, handed me a check for $2,000. He said, this is my offering. This is what I do with my offering. I wait for the right opportunity. This is the right opportunity. So that Sunday, before I had taken an offering, the next Sunday, we were already halfway to our goal. The next Sunday, the rest of you gave, and we reached our goal, and we sent one 
1,000 Bibles to India. There's a matching grant, so 2,000 Bibles went to India. Now, what's really neat is Bible League tells us that when a Bible was sent to one of these countries where Bibles are so few and far between, that you will get about 20 people reading the same Bible. Now, when you think about it, we sent 2,000 Bibles, and 20 people were reading each one of those Bibles, so 40,000 people were reading those Bibles. I want to let you know, that was an opportunity. And God laid it on our hearts to do it, and you gave generously your offering to meet that need. That's how God works. He knows who has needs. He knows where the needs are. He'll put that on our heart. So you've got to make a plan. You've got to stick to it. You've got to be consistent. And the second thing is you've got to make sure your attitude honors God. Okay, you say, what's my attitude got to be? Well, no reluctance. Uh, not, no sense of being forced by anyone else. You're going to give it cheerfully. The word is hilarioso which is the word we get hilarious from. So when you give, you ought to be given hilariously. And just be happy when you give to God. You cannot outgive God. God promises you that. You might say, Dave, uh, how can I give to God cheerfully when I know God doesn't need my money? And I don't have it to give. I need it. Well, here's two thoughts for you. Number one, by making a plan and giving to God, you stop robbing God. I think it's good not to rob God, okay? Second of all, here's a chance for you to put God to the test. God, is it true that you never fail? Wouldn't that be neat? Put him to the test, discover it's true. God never fails. Now remember, you've got to give him some time. He doesn't need the time, but he uses time to see our consistency, to see our commitment, to see that we're going to hang in there, trusting him to make ends meet. But God says, go ahead and test me. So I thought, well, maybe if I was in that situation where I was really wrestling, I might say to God, Lord, I've made a plan, and I, I'm, I'm sorry that I've been robbing you in the past, I didn't know it, or I did know it, but I really thought I'd been eating my money more than you did, and so now what I've decided to do is I'm going to give you out of every paycheck I get X number of dollars. Having never really done this before, it is a real step of faith, so I remind you that I'm testing you. I know nothing's impossible for you, but my faith is kind of weak, and, and I'm going to exercise my faith, and I'm going to give to the Lord's work this money, and every Sunday when the offering plate comes by, I'm going to go, yippee. And uh, Lord, because my eyes don't always see your blessings, I ask that you open my eyes to see them. And may I be quick to write them down so that I can rejoice over the blessings that you bring into my life. That would be an interesting prayer to pray, wouldn't it? And then just sit back three months from now and sit back and say, wow, look at all the things that God has done in response to my faithfulness, to obedience, to his word. I'll give you an illustration. Uh, I led a man to Christ. His name was Don. He and his wife Donna and his family came over to our house and Jeanette and I decided we would disciple them and we would use an evening a meal together and then we would talk about the things of the Lord. Um, somewhere along the line in the process, maybe a half a year or a year down the line, uh, we started talking about tithing. And Don said to me, I don't tithe. I make $500 a week. I give God $5 a week. And I have nothing left over at the end of the month. So how in the world can I give God $50 a week when $5 already leaves me with nothing to give? And I said to him, I want to challenge you. I read the Malachi passage. I talked about it with him. And I said, I want you to challenge, I want to, challenge you to put God to the test. Give God $50 a week for the next three months and see what happens. At the end of the first month, Don was sitting at our table eating dinner. And he said, I just got to tell you what's happened this month. He said, I've been very faithful in giving to God $50 a week out of every paycheck. 
And toward the end of this month, my grandmother, who lives in Tennessee, passed away, and we went down for her funeral, and the trip cost us $90. He said, you would not believe this, but you know how much extra we had at the end of the month? $90. And he looked at me, he said, that's not the real miracle. The real miracle is, not only did God make up for the $200 that I started giving him, which is $180 more than I normally gave, but God also supplied the extra 90 for the trip. He said, God doesn't fail. Now that's a real test for a young man in the Lord, giving God an opportunity to prove himself, and God proved himself to him. Now, let's look at some benefits, quickly on these benefits. Number one, God blesses you. God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. There was a single mom who decided she uh, was going to give to God, but she had a problem. She had no job, and her husband just barely gave her enough money that she could put some food on the table for the children. But God had begun to speak to her heart and said, you need to give, just like the widow who gave two mites. And so she decided she would give to God a little bit of money out of the grocery money that her husband was giving her. No sooner did she start giving that little bit of money to the Lord, but she got a call and she got a job working for a cookbook company. They paid her to go grocery shopping and then to come and prepare meals that they would take photographs of and put those photographs in books. And not only did they pay her to grocery shop, but they told her that after they had taken the pictures, she could take all the groceries home and take the, what she prepared home for her children. And God provided meals for her kids and some money. And all she was given was a little bit out of what grocery money she had. And she will tell you that God met her needs. God blessed her. And you say, well, why did God bless her? Because God was pleased with her. God loves a cheerful giver. He looked down and said, there's my girl. Look at that. She looked at the Bible and she believed she should give and she listened to my prompting and she gave to me out of what little she had and I'm saying, way to go. I'm happy for you. The growth is coming. Watch me meet your needs. Because you're obedient. Second of all, part of the blessing part, God meets our every need. Listen to verse 8. Now, I want you to home in on the all, the word all, okay? And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in, help me, all things at all times, having all that you need, you may abound in every good work. So God sits back and says, if you're going to be obedient to me and you're going to give to me, I'm a God who is able to bless you in all things at all times and meet all of your needs because I am a God of great grace. And when you're abound, when you have all needs met at all times and all things, then you're going to be able to meet the needs of others. So God then agrees, God increases your ability to give to other people who are in need. That's why he says, so that you will abound in every good work. You say, well, I don't know how this works. How does it work? Well, God's, we either remove some of the things in your finances that are draining your checking account, or God may just give you a raise or give you a new job, or God may help you manage the money that he's given you better than you're managing it now so that you're being very wise with the use of your money. And because your finances are in better shape, God will be able to use you to bless others who are in need. How many times have you said, boy, I wish I could help that person, but the funds aren't there? You ever said that? So God sits back and says, because you're giving, I'm going to give you and going to meet all your needs at all times, and then I'm going to turn around and give you some more than you need so that when you see somebody in need, you can reach out and meet that need. So you don't have to say, I wish I could help. So you can help. 
So the second blessing is you'll be able to bless others. Okay, listen to verse 11 and 12. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You know, there is really no limit to how God can use us if we choose to give generously. There's no limit. I have a story here. I want to read it for you. It's called The Amazing Story of a Millionaire Giver. A few years ago, I heard a man named Steve from California speak at a Christian conference. He told the story about how he and his wife became millionaire givers. Steve owned a small business and made about $50,000 a year. He went to a Campus Crusade for Christ conference and heard Dr. Bill Bright challenge everyone in the audience to each give a $1 million gift to the Lord's work. After the message, he went up to Dr. Bright and asked, Obviously, you didn't really mean that my wife and I should be included in the people that will give a million dollars to the Lord's work. Bill Bright asked, Well, how much did you make last year? Steve said $50,000. Dr. Bright then asked him, How much did you give to the Lord last year? And Steve said, I gave $15,000. Steve thought Dr. Bright would be impressed that he gave more than 25% of his income to the Lord. Got to find my, where am I? Dr. Bright said, well, next year, trust God to allow you to give $50,000. But Steve said, that's my entire salary. Dr. Bright said, trust God, and if he provides you with the funds, give $50,000. Steve went home. And amazingly, his little business did well, and he and his family lived on their $50,000 salary, and they gave $50,000 to the Lord's work. The next year, by faith, they pledged to themselves and to the Lord that they would continue to live on $50,000, but would seek to give $100,000 to the Lord's work if God provided Amazingly, through some unbelievable circumstances and a great testing of their faith, they were able to give $100,000 that year. Each year, they continued to live on the basic salary and give their extra income to the Lord's work. And believe it or not, within five years, they had given over a million dollars to the Lord. Now, a little inscription at the bottom of that story is sometimes give, God gives us more income not to raise the standard of our living, but to increase the standard of our giving. There is nothing impossible for God if you and I will trust him. And that's an incredible story. Now, can you imagine the number of people a million dollars over a five-year period could help? When God decides to bless us, he not only blesses us, he blesses others through us. Then others bless God. Listen to what it says. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. So those people who are blessed by receiving some gifts that meet their needs they are going to turn around and they are going to praise God. They are going to thank God. They're going to glorify God for meeting their needs through us. And what do we want more than anything but God to be glorified through the things that we do? And then those people that receive gifts from us, they will pray for us. I want you to think about that. If a person knows where the gifts are coming from, the Bible says that they'll be so excited to praise God, and then they'll turn around and begin to pray for us. That's what it says in verse 14. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. I want you to think about this. When we give to Reuben and his ministry, Reuben writes back to us and periodically will say, you know, the, the people that you are touching with your generosity they are praying for KUMC. They literally are saying, God, bless the people of KUMC. They have been so good to us. They minister to us. They meet our needs. 
Thank you for their involvement in our life. Just think. You could give to some missionary. Some missionary could give to somebody out there in the mission field. And that person and their family that night get on their knees and thank God for you. Somebody in Africa thanking God for you. Have you thought about that? That maybe tonight somebody in the Dominican Republic will be on their knees thanking God for you? Wouldn't that be neat? You know, how many times have you prayed for other people that are outside of your country? There are people outside of our country that are praying for you and for me. So listen carefully. When you give God his tithe, the church that you attend will have no problems meeting their needs or doing ministry. Guarantee it. Because the average person gives 2.5% of their income to God. So if all of us gave 10% of our income to God, we'd have an abundance, wouldn't we? Dave would like that. <laughs> Just because he could pay the bills without having to worry where the money was coming from next week. Second of all, when you give your tithes and your offerings, God blesses us because we're walking in obedience. Two, we're able to bless other people because our tithes go to, and our offerings go to others. Others will bless God and give him glory, and others will pray for you and me. Praise God. Let's just sort of conclude with 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 7. It's not in your notes. Listen to what it says. Just as you are excelling in everything, See that you also excel in the grace of giving. Vanessa, praise team to come up. We're going to have a word of prayer together. Lord, I just pray that you'll take the words that I've shared that come from your scriptures that you have inspired, that we will see that you aren't concerned about getting money because you're broke. You're concerned about us giving so that we learn to trust you, so that you can bless us, so that we can be a blessing to others, so that others might praise you, so that others will pray for us. Help us to realize, Father, that there is no way that giving to God is going to cause us to have to suffer because we gave to you. You are God who tells us that you're going to give it to us, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. If we follow your word, if we're consistent in giving to you what we have purposed within our heart to give, according to the way that you prospered us, help us to be what it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 7. May we excel in the grace of giving. And this is my prayer for each one of us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.